Well, the time has come. After approximately three years of ministry, Jesus has entered into his final week. A week that many have referred to as Holy Week, and some of us like to refer to as the week that changed the world. The week that changed the world. From his preparation in Bethany to his confrontation and altercation in the temple, from his isolation in the garden to his determination before Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator. Follow along with me as we pick up at Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. And there we read, Now the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and scribes were looking for a covert way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany, Reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke open the jar and poured it on Jesus' head. Some of those present, however, expressed their indignation to one another. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful deed to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could to anoint my body in advance of my burial. And truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Let's pause and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the work of your spirit in this place. And now, Father, I declare my dependence upon your Holy Spirit. For myself and each one in the sound of my voice, have your way, O God, for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, as we look more closely at our text there in Mark 14, specifically at what served as the preparation for Jesus' eventual burial following his crucifixion, I want us to not only think about this history-making moment of a certain woman's worship of Jesus, but I want you to think about your own life of worship today. I want you to think about your own life of worship today. You see, if there's anything that I want to drive home, it's that your worship is more than something that you do on a Sunday morning. It's more than just simply singing the right songs or saying the right amens or hallelujahs or praise the Lord's. It's about everything that you and I do with all of our lives, with our time, with our treasure, with our talents. It's about living a life of worship. So today I want to ask you, are you living a life of worship? Are you living a life of worship? And with that, I want you to think today with me about three things as we find in our text. Number one, the center of your worship. Number two, the cost of your worship. And number three, the cause of your worship. Notice firstly that this woman's act of worship there in Mark's gospel was directed not simply at just anyone, but at Jesus himself. There's no doubt that Jesus was the center of her worship that day. In other words, of all the people that were in the room and everything that was happening, she knew that only one was worthy of her sacrifice and her gift. Only one. In fact, our passage in Mark 14 records Jesus saying, She has done a beautiful deed. To whom? To me. To me. Jesus recognized that he was the center of her worship. 
You see, everything in the gospel points to Jesus being the object and the center of this woman's worship. Let's face it, sometimes, though, we can, we can get off track, can't we? Just think with me for a moment. We can get off track in our worship. We can let other things, let other people become that center of our lives, the center of our focus, the center of our worship. Hey, we can even make ourselves the center of our worship. And this gets really, really tricky when you seem to be doing um, what you're doing for God to worship and glorify him. At least that's what it seems on the outside, and maybe that's what it seems to everybody else who's looking in. But deep down, the truth is, is that what you're doing, even when it's something that's seemingly for God, it's actually less about God and more about ourselves. Man, it gets tricky. And boy, does it get dangerous. In other words, it becomes more about what makes us feel good. I pray today as we come into this place and we come to give our worship, we come to give our praise, that it's more than, I'm just looking to see what I can get out of this. Oh, I feel so much better right now. Praise God for the byproducts of our worship. The byproducts of healing, of joy, of love, of peace. But may they not be the center focus of our worship. Again, sometimes it gets tricky because we end up doing what we're doing, even seemingly for God, for what makes us feel good. And even like those in Jesus' day, sometimes for what makes us look good. Look a certain part. Appear a certain way to everybody else, maybe in the room, in the church. I have to look a certain way, appear a certain way. And really, it has nothing to do with what's going on deep down in your life, and you know it, and God knows it but you're willing to do it because of everybody else around you. What are you doing in those moments? You're you're looking to create a certain false appearance. And really what you're doing in those moments is you don't have Jesus as the center of your worship. Neither do I in those moments. Instead, we're putting others, how we appear before them, as the center of our worship, which really spins back around to putting ourselves as the center of that. Again, sometimes we're looking to fill a particular need in our lives. But what this woman did wasn't about putting on a religious show for others to see. This wasn't about somehow getting others to point to her and say, isn't she amazing? Oh, she is something else, that woman. This wasn't about that. This wasn't about drawing attention to her great sacrifice from those in the, in the room, in the house. It wasn't about doing something so that she would benefit from it. Well, if I give this, I know that God's going to give me a hundredfold back. I know if I do this, he's going to bless me ten times, thirty times, sixty times. Sure, there are principles in God's word all about that, but be very careful when we spin it around. What are we doing once again? We're once again putting ourselves as the center of our worship rather than the only one who's worthy of our worship. She didn't do it that day with some sort of like, if I do this, then, you know, this is what's going to happen instead. No, there doesn't seem to be any indication that what she did was really for herself. Instead, What she did was because she wanted, with all that she had, to love and honor Jesus. To love and honor Jesus. He was the center of her focus and worship that day. Folks, listen. It doesn't take much to get off track in our worship. And I'll say it again. Even in the things that we're seemingly doing for God, It doesn't take much. Sometimes it's just a few degrees, so to speak, that can make a huge difference. Jim Churn writes, back in 1979, 257 people left New Zealand for a sightseeing flight to Antarctica. Unknown to the pilots, there was a two-degree error in the flight coordinates, two degrees. Most people hearing that would think, that's close enough. 
But that two degree error, in fact, placed the aircraft 28 miles to the east of what was the planned route. As the pilots approached what they thought was their intended destination to give the sightseers a better look of the landscapes, they descended to a lower altitude. Although the pilots had years of experience, they had never made this particular flight before. So they had no way of knowing that the incorrect coordinates had, been, had placed them directly in the path of Mount Erebus, an active volcano that rises from the frozen landscape to a height more than 12,000 feet. Sadly, the plane crashed into the side of the volcano, and there were no survivors. Folks, a few degrees, a few degrees Amen. makes a huge difference. A huge, a huge difference. The direction of your worship is much like that flight. If you and I are off just a few degrees, if you end up giving your ultimate love, your ultimate devotion to something else, to someone else other than God, if you make an idol of certain desires or longings of your heart, if you put yourself on the throne of your life rather than God himself, if you get off just a few degrees in your worship and in, in, in what you do for God, the results can be catastrophic. This is why all throughout the Hebrew Bible, God was always so uncompromising and and, and just relentless when it came to warning his people against worshiping counterfeit gods of the peoples all around them. He warned them about even getting off just a little bit from keeping him as the center of their worship. This wasn't about God feeling insecure or somehow worrying about feeling unloved. This was about him knowing the disaster that they were headed for if they got off course, if the direction and center of their worship was anything other than him. Let me ask you, whom or what are you truly worshiping today? The answer might seem obvious with certain church or Christian phrases to give, but I want to ask you, would you reflect on your heart and your life, where your thoughts are, where your mind is? What are the things that are consuming your attention and your focus? Where is the center of your worship today? Who is it? What is it that has become or that has been the center of your worship, the center of your focus? Whom are you living for? Not simply whom are you singing to or singing about. That's a part of our worship. But whom are you living for? Whom are you living for? Do you need to recalculate today? Do you need to put in new coordinates? Do you need today to get back on course? Do some of you today need to make not just a few tweaks, but maybe a full 180? A full turnaround? You see, for the woman in our passage, Jesus was at the center of her worship, and that's God's call to you and me today as well. Amen. The center Amen. of your worship. Secondly, notice the cost of her worship. Did you notice what this woman was willing to spend to give up for Jesus? Notice again how Mark tells us that this woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke open the jar, broke open the jar, and poured it on Jesus' head. And this passage will go on to confirm what the other Gospels tell us, that this perfume was worth about 300 denarii. 300 denarii. Now, some of your uh, translations will give us a little more clue as to what this means. But for some of you wondering, well, wh what does that mean exactly? How much was that? Well, let's put it this way. A single Roman denarius was a coin that was worth about a day's wages. A single denarius, about a day's worth of work. And this was worth about 300 denarii. 
That means you're talking about nearly a year's salary. You do the math. So regardless of the exact value, this we do know. This perfume or oil, which might have been even imported from other lands at some time, maybe in the past, maybe it was some sort of family heirloom. We, we, we don't know all the pieces here, but this we know, that what she poured out on Jesus was extremely, extremely costly. I'm talking to you today about the cost of your worship cost of your worship. In fact, once the flask was broken and its contents were poured out, there was no turning back. There was no somehow scooping it up or trying to piece it back together. That was it. There was no turning back. Could I just say, God is looking for some worshipers who will go at it, who will go after Jesus, saying no turning back. No turning back. Jesus, you're worth it. You're worth my everything. You're worth my all. And, and, and sometimes he's there's no place for saying, well, if somehow maybe I can, I can put the toothpaste back in the tube again. No, and that's not the type of worshiper Jesus is looking for. He's looking for you and me to go at this with a resolve, saying, Jesus, I give you my everything. I, I, I give you my all, Lord. No, no turning back. I've decided to follow you with all my life. No turning back. No turning back. For this woman, there was no turning back. In other words, there was nothing cheap or easy about her worship, but she knew that Jesus was worth it. Amen. I just want to assure you today, he's worth it. Amen. He's worth it. Amen. In fact, that's what worship is really all about. Yes. Worth-ship. Yes. Worth-ship. It's not just about singing songs or lifting hands, but let me put it this way, if I could just give it to you this way. Worship is recognizing the worth or value. In other words, the worthiness of God in such a way that you cannot help but choose. It's a choice, folks, but you choose to honor and revere him through all of your life. Amen. Through all of your life. In other words, you're willing to spend whatever it takes to serve and glorify him, even like this woman did. And let's face it. What you and I value, we're willing to spend on. Yes. Yes. What, you, what you value in life, there are some things in life that you just say, this is not that important to me. There are other things in life you're like, yep, I got to have that. That's important to me. And all of a sudden, you'll spend on it. You'll spend on it. Let me ask some of you today. Um, which would you rather spend on? Um, the look of a home or the location of a home? Uh, which would you rather spend on? Um, the uh, restaurant with the gourmet chef or the restaurant with a beautiful ambiance and view? Gourmet. I'm just wondering. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Yes. We make choices in life. Which would you rather spend on? The car with that mega horsepower? or that car with the ultimate fuel efficiency. <laughs> what you value in life, you're willing to spend on. You're willing to spend on. You know, when King David of Israel was seeking to buy a particular location in order to offer sacrifices in obedience to God's command, the owner of the property said to him, Look, I will give you the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all. In other words, don't worry, David. I got you. We're good. It's covered. It's covered. David said, No. No. I insist on paying the full price, for I will not take for the Lord what belongs to you, nor will I offer burnt offerings that cost me what? Nothing. 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 Cost me nothing. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, David, what are you kidding me? What are you doing? Take the deal. Just say, praise God. Thank you for that blessing, dude. Thank you for that blessing. I mean, listen, when is the last time 
any of us have insisted on paying the full price for anything at the store. I know some of you. I know how you're rolling. You even go to the clearance rack at 70% off, and you still look to get a discount on that item. <laughs> Trying to find a little tear, a little mark, or something that you can get the clerk or the manager to discount. All right, am I just confessing things, or is that just... <laughs> Okay, fine, 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 it's me. Preach, preach, preach. But folks, that's, that's the thing about worship. True worship. It doesn't look for a percentage off. It doesn't look for the cheaper way to go. The easier way to do things. Instead, it looks to give the very best. To the very one who gave his very best. The best. Does it cost you to live a life of worship? You better believe it. To live a life of worship. You better believe it. But it's those who choose to count the cost and to worship and serve Jesus anyway who make the greatest impact for God. You know, that's why we still talk about these men and women of the faith from not just sometimes decades, but centuries ago, even millennia gone by, but... It's why we tell the stories of men like Eric Liddell and why these men still capture our hearts. A man like Eric Liddell, nearly 80 years after his death. Born to missionaries in China. Eric Liddell would grow up not only with the gift of a Christian heritage, but with the gift of speed. I'm talking real speed, like Usain Bolt speed. <laughs> In fact, one biographer writes, while at the University of Edinburgh, Eric became famous for being the fastest runner in Scotland. Newspapers carried stories of his athletic feats, and many believed he was a potential Olympic winner. However, at the 1924 Olympics, Liddell, a devout Christian, dropped out of the 100-meter run, his strongest event. Why? because the qualifying heats were scheduled for a Sunday. He wouldn't do it. Instead, he trained for the 200 and 400 meter sprints. At the games, he finished third in the 200 meter run, gaining a bronze medal, and he turned in a stellar performance to win the 400 meters. Starting in the outside lane, we're told, Liddell sprinted out of the blocks and set such a speed that two other runners fell trying to keep up with him. He won the race, listen folks, in a record time of 47.6 seconds, which was, which was an Olympic and world record. But the story goes on. Because even with an astounding Olympic victory, in 1925, Eric Liddell returned to China to follow in his parents' chosen work to serve as a missionary teacher. Think about it. This Olympian, this champion, with all that now he can, he can do, perhaps, and, and all that, that, that he, he's able to celebrate, and others just lifting him and, and applauding him, but he chooses to go back to China to do this missionary work. By 1941, life in China had become so dangerous because of the threat from the Japanese, so the British government advised British nationalists to leave. Eric's wife and children left for Canada to stay with her family while Eric accepted a position at a rural mission station in China which served the poor. He joined his brother Rob, who was a doctor there. The station was severely short of help, and missionaries there, they were exhausted. A constant stream of locals came at all hours for medical treatment. Eric arrived at the station in time to relieve his brother, who was ill and needing to go on furlough, and Eric himself suffered many hardships by staying on at the mission, continuing to do all he could to help people. As fighting between the Chinese army and invading Japanese troops reached where they were, the Japanese took over the mission station and Eric returned to Tianjin. In 1943, he was then placed in a Japanese internment camp, a war camp. 
And there he continued to faithfully serve those in that camp with the love of Jesus. You can read firsthand testimonies of those that witnessed the amazing love and service done by this man that loved Jesus and others. He died on the 21st of February, 1945, just five months before he and the others would have been liberated. Some might look at the life of Eric Liddell with his gifts, with his abilities, with all that he could have done, and say, what a waste. What a waste. Why do that? Why give up all that for that? What a waste. Folks, think with me. That was the very thing that they said about the woman in our text and what she poured out on Jesus. They said, what a waste. Would you hear me? When others saw waste, Jesus saw worship. Saw worship. I'm talking about the cost of your worship. The cost of your worship. Listen, when you choose to spend your all on Jesus, when you choose to give God what costs you, others might not get it all. They might not understand it all. They may even accuse you of being wasteful. Why are you doing this? Why go to the mission field? Why, why give your life to Jesus in this way? Why serve him in that way? Why let go of that relationship? Why give up this, this lucrative career over here? Why do this with your life? Why, why give up all that for, for what? For, for who? For, for Jesus? They might accuse you of all sorts of things. But you just remember, they're not the ones that you're ultimately living for. They're not the ones that you're seeking to please. I hope not. And they're definitely not the ones that you're going to be standing before one day. But he will. In fact, history tells us regarding Eric Liddell that after going to China in 1925, he returned to Scotland only twice, in 1932 and again in 1939. And on one occasion, he was asked if he ever regretted his decision to leave behind the fame and glory of athletics. Eric responded, it's natural for a chap to think over all that sometimes. But I'm glad I'm at the work I'm engaged in now. A fellow's life counts for far more at this than the other. At this of serving Jesus, even among the poorest, in pouring out my life in ways that others might never know. This is far far more valuable than any trophies or medals I could ever receive. You see, worshiping and serving Jesus won't always be easy. It will definitely not be chief. In fact, it might even cost you everything. But by the word of the Lord Jesus himself, I want to assure you that it will always be worth it. It will always be worth it. I'm going to ask our musicians to come this time. As we come to our final point, talking about the cause of your worship. The cause of your worship. Let's face it, looking at our passage in Mark 14 might leave you guessing. When trying to figure out the cause of this costly and sacrificial act of worship performed by this woman. But I believe that's where the other gospel writers can help us. Now, there's a variety of anointings by women in the Gospels that we find. But I do believe that if we treat these even variety of anointings of Jesus in the Gospels as one and the same, in spite of the differences that are observed by the Gospel writers, then John's Gospel tells us that this woman was actually Mary of Bethany the sister of a woman named Martha and a man named Lazarus. 
Lazarus, well, he was a man that Jesus had earlier raised from the dead. And Luke's gospel, seemingly pointing to the same event, records Jesus saying, Therefore, I tell you, because her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much. Now again, I, I'm just going to put it out there. Always check and double check what I or any others are preaching and teaching. Does that make sense? You have to examine the word for yourself. And, and I could be wrong in this, in linking all these women together as one and the same. I, 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 I want to put that on the table. But if I'm right, if I'm right, if we're correct in linking these accounts together, then what the Gospels tell us about this woman in Mark 14 is that this woman, seemingly Mary, was so impacted by what Jesus had done for her and for her family that she couldn't help but give him her best in worship. Her best. The change and transformation that Jesus brought to her life and family. The forgiveness that she experienced, the freedom that she experienced through Jesus became the cause of her worship. The cause of her worship. So I got to ask you today, what about you? Do you have that type of cause in your life? A cause to worship? Do you have a cause or a reason to worship God today? To worship Jesus? Do you have a cause today? Listen, without a doubt, God is worthy of our worship regardless of what he's done for you and me. I hope you could say amen. In other words, he's worthy of our worship just for who he is. But folks, I can't help but see also what the Bible says in various, various other spots from, well, the front to the back. There is a direct connection in the Bible between the worship of God, the worship of Jesus, and what he has accomplished or done. Both on a grand cosmological level, you know, like for the universe, for the world, and also on a corporate, even a personal level for people like you and me. There's a direct connection between the two. Our worship and what he has done. What he's done. So let me ask you, have you come to know the life-changing, chain-breaking, joy-giving love of Jesus? Have you come to know him in that way? Because for some of us, we come into a room like this, we tune in even to a video maybe, and we just go, I don't get it. What are all those people so excited about? What are they doing? I know as the others saw that woman that day pouring this oil on Jesus' head and eventually wiping his feet with her tears and, and, and anointing his feet as well. Again, they're probably, what is she doing? Again, what a waste. But you know what they didn't know? They didn't know her story. They didn't know her story. They didn't know a side of Jesus that she knew. That she knew. And you know, that happens to us all the time. We not only accuse people and we say, oh, what's gotten into them? How come they're like this? They seem, oh, they're so fanatical. Like, what, what, is, what is up with them? They're, they're just too much for me. Maybe you don't know their story. You don't know what Jesus set them free of. And what you know, sometimes we... we we end up talking about people and saying things about people because, well, sometimes we only know one side of people. We only know them in one type of relationship. And, and, and based upon that relationship and the way that we constantly see them, you're probably doing that about me today. Based upon, oh, he's so, so this, he's so that. Well, you know, my wife could tell you a few other things about me. 
Just ask my wife, ask my boys, ask those who know me well. What is it? Oftentimes we only know one side of a person. Listen, folks, we do the same thing with Jesus. We simply know him as this historical figure, as this prophet from the past. But Jesus wants you to know a completely different side of him. Oh, that you would know him for who he is. That you would know him. You would know his love. You would know the forgiveness that he wants to give you. That he came to give you. Do you know him today? You see, when you know that side of Jesus, when you've experienced that freedom in his life, like I've experienced, like others here in this room have experienced, like countless others have been changed and transformed by, man, you will find your cause for worship. Where all of a sudden you're not so much about holding back your time, your treasure, your talents, your song, your hands. All of a sudden you'll realize, boy, nobody has to force you. You... You, have, you will have found your cause to give him your best. Do you need your cause today? I'm going to ask you to stand all across this room today. As Kivian just leads us in this song with the team, some of you would say to me today, Pastor John, I don't know Jesus in that way. I don't know his forgiveness like you're talking about. I've, I've prayed prayers, but I don't know that that lifting of that guilt, that, that lifting of that shame in my life like you're talking about. I don't know that freedom that you're, you're speaking of today, but I want to know. I want to know it today. I want to know Jesus in this way that you're speaking about. As Kivian just begins to lead us, I'm just going to invite you to come. And I'll just say to those of you today, whether you are speaking fluently in English or fluently in Spanish, you can come. You can come. We'll be here to pray with you. We'll be here to meet you. Would you just begin to come right now all across this room? Some of you saying, I need the forgiveness of God today. I want to know Jesus like you're talking about. Pastor John, I, I want to know him like you know him. I want to know him the way that others know him. I, I, I want to know him today. I want to pour my life out to him. Others of you just coming today, just saying, yes, I want to live that life of worship. I don't want to just go through the motions of church and Sundays, but I want to live a life with all that I have, choosing to give him my very best. Would you just begin to come all across this room? You can come. You need prayer today, whatever the need might be, from health to finances to relationships, you can come right now. Begin to come. Give myself away. You can begin to come. You need prayer in whatever area. You can come. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Come. Come. I give myself away so you can use me. Listen, you might look at your life as broken, but when you come humbly before Jesus, when you come before him, laying down your life, laying down your sin, laying down your all, you might come broken, but Jesus sees beautiful. He sees beautiful. Beautiful. Come. Give him your life. Give him your worship today. Say yes to him. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Oh, I give myself away so you can use me. Thank you, prayer team. Give myself away.
stand. Some of you are Lord, making a turn. Some of you are making a turn today. Is in your Jesus has not been the center of your focus, Lord, center of your worship. And I know we all get off a few degrees, but today you're making a turn. It's called repentance. And you're saying, Jesus, I want you at the center. Would you forgive me for allowing idols in my heart and life? I put you first. Nobody else, nothing else. I put you first. Be the center of my focus of my life today, oh God. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. declaration today to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you oh to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you Oh, oh, oh. 
worship you. I live, I live to worship you. And only you. To worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. To worship you. I live to worship you. we love you. We thank you for first loving us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Folks, this place is going to continue to remain open for prayer. You stay as long as you need to. Pray as long as you want to. In just a few moments when others are leaving, Please, if you're picking up children, you'll head out the doors to my right, down that stairwell. Please be mindful of those that are still praying, that are still worshiping. Let me remind you today, you, you did not simply come to church. You are the church. So go and be the church this week. a life that's living, living a life of worship. Let's be a people who are living lives of worship with Jesus at the center of our focus, that we're counting the cost and willing to give him our very best, and that we would help others to know the same reason, that same cause that we've come to find be the church this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. This place is open for continued prayer. We'll be here. Hey, Faith Online. We want to thank you once again for joining us today. Now, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, please be sure to click the next steps link below. If you're having trouble getting to us in person because of life circumstances and would welcome a visit from our care team, please let us know by clicking the connect link below. Finally, if God's been using this ministry as a blessing in your life, uh, we would love for you to do three things. Number one, subscribe to this channel. Number two, share this link with others. And finally, number three, Support the work of this church by praying for us and giving financially as God would lead you. Well, until next time, remember, living for Jesus won't always be easy, but it will always be worth it.